Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Flowers are an important food source for butterflies. Today, we will be planting some. Also, goats are a fun but unusual addition to the garden. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen is the Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis, and Jeff Terry will be joining me later. Hi, right, Joellen. It's good to see you. Good to see you. What are we going to do today? Uh, we got to look at our butterfly garden that we planted a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and we're going to reassess it and maybe add some more plants to it. Um, this is the parsley. Of course, parsley is a biannual and okay. it's gone to seed. So we'll let a few of these seeds, you know, drift to the ground to maybe germinate for next year. Uh, we've got, still have our, our butterfly weed, which is nice. Um, That's good. They do have some <laughs> aphids in them, unfortunately. And uh, then we also have our some a few weeds here yeah, that need to be taken tail. out. All we right. have our sedum that will uh, that will uh, bloom in the fall, and we have our oregano that seems to be still blooming. So mm -hmm. when they stop blooming, that's when we'll cut off all the seed heads of that. But since it's blooming, it's uh, it's still we're going to leave that for now. Okay. And of course, then on the end we have a whole lot of the aster. Yes. Uh, but it really likes the soil in this bed, and so it's kind of taken over. So we've got to take it under control and divide it, and then we can share the uh, divisions. Okay. Uh, and there's a little bit of sage over here too that's left. <laughs> so we will start working on this and getting it under control, and then hopefully plant some more plants. Okay. Well, so you cut those all the way back, huh? We got some parsley coming up that's new, so we'll leave that. Hopefully some of these seeds will come back this next year. And it looks like we have some of our poker plant oh, still yeah. here. So yay, we'll leave that. That'll bloom in the spring. It's time to get out the shovel to, to divide the uh, aster. In our soils here, this aster there um, doesn't really grow wild like this. Uh, our soils are really heavy and thick, and they tend to, uh, they don't uh, get as wide. But this soil in here is so nice and loose that this has gone a little bit wilder than it does in the, in the ground. There you go. That's an awful lot of dirt on that. There yeah. we go. Very happy here. Let's get a, yeah, let's try get to get it. this out so the sage can get some okay. light. Ah, uh, yeah. Come on, get out. You know you like it in there. All right, bless you. And that's our little sand. It's the butterfly beach. Butterfly's beach. And even though this does bloom, I want the butterflies to be able to see their little beach. The little beach. So I'm just gonna cut some of this back. Right. See if I can get that out. And then we'll place their their little beach mm -hmm. back. They like to sip the water, and then they like to sun themselves on the rocks around it. See, they couldn't see it. So they couldn't That's see it. It was buried. <laughs> now that we've gotten all of the dead and overgrown plants out of the way, it's time to add some new ones. Uh, so we're going to add some some new ones in here. Some that were in here before that seem to have disappeared and uh, and a new one. Okay. Here is some Gallardia. This yeah. was in here before, but it has disappeared. So we need to add this to the garden. Okay. And I'm thinking he needs to be planted right here. All right. Then this is, we had a cone flower before. It was yeah. purple. This one is yellow. And here is a, a tip. This, this is okay. It's not uh, too dry. It's a little bit too wet. 
doesn't like to be in this container. It's a little uh, bit of root bound uh -huh. and it, it doesn't like to be too wet. So it's going to be happy to put in here uh, in a, a drier situation. Uh -huh. So we'll plant him in the back right here on the south side. It'd be nice and dry. Nice and dry for him. <laughs> Uh, something else that was in here uh -huh. that uh, has disappeared is this uh, Russian sage. The, yeah. It blooms real, real pretty. And so we're going to plant that in here. It's got okay. some nice blooms. I forgot we had that in there. Yeah, we have mm. that in here. And lastly, something that we had in here that has disappeared is Monarda. Monarda. This yeah. is a pink Monarda. And we will plant that in here also. Good. And then our garden will be complete. Good. All right. I guess we get to work, right? Now we get to work. Ah, oh, look what we have here. Hey, buddy. A butterfly already hey, on buddy. the water. He says, oh, I like that one. Pretty good. Just give us a minute, all right? <laughs> give us a minute. These have been watered pretty good. Now our butterfly flame can come back. Oh wow. Look at this. They've got a lot of nice. circling roots. So we're gonna we're gonna try to make them stop doing that. Just take a few places around here. Very healthy plant. All right. That will probably like the drier soil. Oh yeah, it will. Dry it is. It's pretty dry. We'll have to water everything in, but then it can dry out between waterings. We have some butterfly weed seeds that we wanted to add in this small corner to get some more butterfly weed in here. And so I'm going to plant them here just in this corner and we'll see what comes up this next year. And we don't need the pods, but we do need the seeds. Need the seeds, right? The fluffy stuff will, will decompose and act as organic matter. Oh, nice. So we'll just kind of Lightly cover, cover them up, them up yeah. lightly, and there we go. Well, look at that. Now we got uh, filled in the spots. With the garden is looking good again, and we're already attracting butterflies. Already, they can't wait. Yes, yeah, some over there. Yeah, yeah, they can't they're, wait. They're, it's, it's, I see uh, you. We'll get some water in their bath and uh, water the plants in, and we'll be ready. You ready to go? Thank you much, y'all. You're welcome. Fun as always. Let's take a look at these peppers here. As you can see from the skin, it seems to be dry. You know, these seem to be skin lesions. Someone would probably ask, could you still eat these peppers? I would, because again, these are just skin lesions. You can actually use your fingernail and just kind of scrape them off a little bit. So it doesn't appear to go any deeper than the outer skin. This may be a physiological disorder, maybe due to extreme heat or lack of moisture or too much moisture. So again, I would actually eat these. I don't think anything's wrong with them. Hi, Mr. Jeff, thank you hey, for man. inviting us out. Thank you, thanks right. for coming out. We got goats. <laughs> we do. <laughs> we have finally got goats here on the farm. How about that? Um, got four of them. Okay. And uh, this is thanks to a friend, Julie Lindau, right. with uh, Shady Creek Farms. She donated these goats. We've got uh, Jasmine here. Uh, Jasmine. We've got Blondie over Blondie. there. 
That's uh, Pepper. All right. And uh, Leo. Leo is right hey, here. Leo's he's hanging out. Yeah, exactly. He's <laughs> hamming it up now. So, so uh, how about a little brief, you know, information, a little basic information mm -hmm. about goats to get us started? Okay. Um, well, they're um, they're uh, one of the first domesticated animals okay. that's ever been. I mean, we, we're talking eleven thousand years ago, oh, and it was there. the that was the beginning of of all this kind of domestication. Okay. Um, ever since then, they've been. Um, uh, well, in the United States, they were brought over probably around the time of the Mayflower. Uh, okay. We've got wow. uh, goats just all over the place. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we're, let's talk about their eyes and their teeth and yes. their stomachs. How about that? Okay. So um, they have uh, rectangular eyes, uh, which are kind of cool. Um, but what it does, they're, you know, they're a prey animal, so they need good peripheral vision. Okay. And the, uh, the flat eyes, the rectangle eyes, give them about 340 degree um, wow. peripheral. And uh, they can see basically everything up to right behind them. Wow. Um, which is kind of cool. Wow. Uh, their teeth, and they're chewing yes, on yeah, your shirt yeah, right teeth, there. Yeah, they only tongue. have one set of bottom teeth, okay. and then a, um, and, and just on the top, they have no teeth whatsoever. Okay. This allows their lips on the top to grab thorny bushes and things like that, and they're sort of almost prehensile uh, ah. lips at the top. How about that? Yeah. And what about their stomachs? Um, the stomach, they're a ruminid, um, so they, they have four stomachs, uh, so four. that allows them to eat uh, very fibrous stuff, so hay, things like that. One of their favorite uh, foods, again, is, is Bermuda hay. They uh -huh. love to do that. And they can, what they do is you know, consume the hay that goes into their first, uh, into the rumen, which is their first stomach. Okay. That's broke, that breaks down all of the, uh, the fatty acids uh, that can be consumed. Then it goes into the reticulum. Yeah. which is sort of the, it's called the honeycomb. Okay. And uh, what that does is uh, grind up the, the fibrous materials. Oh, okay. Then it's pushed on to the, um, the omasum, <laughs> uh, which is then, that, that extracts water uh, from, wow. from the grains or from the, from the uh, grasses. And so they don't need as much water as well. This, they could be in arid climates and not have to worry about that. And then it's finally into their true stomach. And then after finally. that, finally, finally, it goes through all those stages. <laughs> yes, that's just so interesting. Yeah. What about the different breeds? Um, well, what we have here are the. Um, this one is a uh, La Mancha goat. Okay. Uh, they start. They were first introduced, or at least came into um, registered as a breed in about 1927 out in California. Okay. And uh, they have uh, small ears. They're called elf ears. Huh. Or gopher ears, and these are not docked ears. This is the way they were uh, meant to uh, meant to be. Oh wow! And uh, they the theory is that they came from uh, Spanish missionaries that probably came out of the south into California back in the 1600s mm. with a goat that was very similar. It had again gopher ears like that. Okay. So it, that was probably the progenitor for these goats. Okay. For okay. this breed of goat, then we have the dwarf Nigerians. And they're all over the place here. <laughs> and they were they were brought into the United States about 1950, and uh, from West Africa. Okay, not too long ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. And these uh, these are really great. The La Manchas are great milking goats. They um, have a higher uh, butterfat content and just good producers. The Nigerians are good too. These are boys, of course. We don't milk them. Okay. And um, and these guys are actually weathered. They've been um, they, they have been uh, fixed. Okay. Uh, because one thing you don't want to have is a, a male goat uh, anywhere near your milking stations. They will foul, the, uh, there's probably nothing smellier than oh, a male goat. Oh, oh, oh. They are absolutely uh, the smelliest thing on, oh my on the planet. So right. early on we had them fixed and it makes them also um, a little bit more calm. Okay. The boys tend to, you know, if they go into a rut, every so often they really have a shorter lifespan okay. they will live about you know they'll only live eight to ten years if That's they go all. into a rut every eight year so with fixing them as well it makes them mellow it makes them real real just calm okay. a little bit more docile and um, also makes them live longer okay which both all of these will probably live anywhere from 11 to 16 years to 16 even years. yeah okay. um if especially with the milking goats we're not going to leave we're not going to really do high production with these girls, it'll probably just be for a little while, and then you know, as, if you stop milking them by 10 years, um, they'll live for another. You know, they could live up to 16 years. So, wow, yeah. interesting stuff. Look, so somebody's probably wondering, can I have goats in Shelby County? Well, that is a good question. Huh? Um, from what I have read, 
you can have a goat as long as you're not within 1,000 feet of another resident or residence or business. Right. Um, that's kind of hard that's to come up with. Hard. We yeah, have it here hard. at the farm yeah. park. We're not anywhere near right. um, anybody at <laughs> okay. this, you know, at this stage. And um, but I did read where if you could get a permit uh, from the Shelby County um, Health Department. Okay. I have not been able to get in touch with them to confirm that. I I really want to tell anybody in Shelby County to to try to to get in touch and see if that's possible before you even consider a goat. Make sure that it's uh, yeah. possible in your area. As far as uh, Fayette County or Tipton County, any of these places out um, further yeah, away, I doubt that there's even a, an issue at all. You could probably has, okay. have as many goats as you care to. Okay. So how do you house the goats here? Well, here we have, during the summertime, they stay in this little building That's here, nice. and it's yeah. just sort of a three, uh, three walled oh, shed, and it's, it's got the hardware cloth and, and, uh, inside. And actually, it was a chicken coop, oh, uh, but it really that. worked yeah. out. The, the goats have taken it and over. <laughs> and uh, they have enjoy staying out here during the warm weather. But then we also have a stall in the barn that we bring them in when it gets cold. Okay. And uh, then I can heat it just a little bit and, and at least keep them from being in the, in the absolute cold. Goats can weather a lot of, I mean, they, the only thing they don't like is rain. Yeah, it's interesting and, when you told us that earlier. They don't <laughs> like the rain? They do time. not like rain. Uh, just, it just bothers them to know, I mean, they look, I, I can barely get them in to the barn yeah. when it starts raining. They don't want to leave any kind of cover. And when they come out, they're just like hunkered down and just, oh, they absolutely hate the rain. They just don't want to get wet. Yeah, oh they really gosh. don't. <laughs> All right. Well, look, let me, I want to ask you a couple of questions sure. about goat milk and goat meat. Oh, yes. Right. Um, goat milk is is fantastic. It's you know yeah, goats and I've had are, it before. Yeah. It is. It's yeah. really good. It's uh, you know it's naturally homogenized, okay. so it doesn't separate out. Um, lactose intolerant people can drink milk oh, goat's milk as good, well. Good, good. Um, it is uh, one of the. Uh, it's it's probably the most consumed milk and meat on the planet. There are more goats consumed oh. than cattle. Really? Um, without question. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily in the United States, right. but all the rest right. of the right. world. Sure. Um, they're definitely um, th one of the most consumed um, animals. Wow. And, um, and they're great. I've had goat meat before, not these. Uh, yeah, never not never these. these. Yeah, yeah, these yeah. are my babies yeah. here. So, yeah. um, But it's really good. And um, yeah, goat milk raw, of course, you know, we have to be uh, careful with this. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a two sides of the fence on that one where raw milk is, is, is no problem. And then the other side of, of, hom of homogenizing um, or at least uh, you know, heating, heating up the milk. Yeah. And um, it's kind of uh, around here that we call it moon sh moo shine. Um, it's sort of like if you, <laughs> if you, yeah, it's sort of on the, on, you can't, ha can't have it just yet. So. How about that? But, I was in Italy, in, uh, you know, some years ago and a lot of the milk that we drank was oh, yeah. goat milk. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, yeah exactly. I was amazed at that. Yeah, yeah. How about that? It is, it is fantastic. It's um, very, very good. All right. <laughs> but yeah, we appreciate that good information. Like, Goats, Thank you. We appreciate y'all babies. Thanks Hanging a lot. With us. And they've been waiting. And they've been waiting. Yeah, they've been yeah. waiting. Them very, it's as raisins, patient right? as they could. Raisins. raisins. Their favorite treat. So if oh, anybody's coming that? out to the farm park, bring some raisins. Bring some raisins. Come on and, out uh, here to the farm park, y'all. <laughs> Feed them the raisins. Thanks a lot. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate that, Joe. Appreciate Thanks a that. lot. Well, we've done some watering here and to, you need to test to see if you have watered enough. The ground might look wet but it might not have gotten water down in the soil to get to the roots. So after you've watered, you simply dig in the ground and see if it's wet or dry. And you see, that's dry. So we haven't watered that enough. You've only watered the surface. You haven't watered down in where the roots are. If you've watered enough and you dig down, you should come up with wet soil so that you know that you've watered enough to get down to the roots of your plant. So this is a good example of light, shallow watering often is not a good idea because it tends to have the roots come to the surface, which then they're gonna dry out faster. You wanna water infrequently and water nice and deep down to the root system so that the roots will wanna stay down in the soil to have them away from the heat and the stress of the summer. All right, Joellen, it's that Q&A segment. You ready? I'm ready. These are great questions. Good questions. All right, so let's go with the first of your email. This is interesting. I am fighting puncture vine. Could you please give me some advice on how to get rid of this horrible weed? 
we live on a four acre farm and have horses. I would be happy to get rid of it. It has been getting worse every year for the last eight years. Thank you so much. And this is Ann from Chaparral, New Mexico. Wow, getting worse. Puncture vine. Yes. All right. Uh, very spiky. Yes. Uh, the, the, the seed pods of it. And they attached, they, they can actually get into the tires and hooves of yeah. some animals and the tires of your bicycles and things like that. So, yeah, uh, it is something that I would want to get rid of. You can't get rid of it by mowing because really? it is like a carpet on the ground. And you can't till it in because mm -hmm. that'll just make it worse. So the, yeah, actually what they recommend is you, you know, digging it up, but with a hoe. But yeah. for four acres, she can't do that. It's going to be tough. She really needs to see if she can put some pre-emergent on it to not make it worse. And there's only certain, you know, there's, it's, it's really tough. So only certain pre-emergents can be, can be used mm -hmm. for it. And um, it, then it's post-emergent time, but you need to get post-emergent. You need to get post-emergent on it when it's young in the spring. Young and actively growing. Yeah, so a broadleaf weed mm -hmm. herbicide would work. Anything that contains 2,4-D dicamba. Yeah. Uh, if you want to use glyphosate, read the label. Be careful with that. You're mm -hmm. not saying that you have to, but mm -hmm. it is something that you can use. As far as a pre-emerge, trifluralin. Yeah, that's it, right. Is what you can use for that. Just uh, read the label. Uh, and follow that. Uh, but that's going to be a lot of work. You know, it has, the, again, the burr type, you know, seeds, uh, capsules. Mm -hmm. uh, those things can be uh, pretty rough, especially if you have yes. horses and livestock. Yes. Um, so this is going to be a job. It's, and yeah, it's going to be a lot to do. It's but she can, you got to keep at it. Yeah. And just, you know, pre emergence and post emergence. Post emergence in early spring is going to be your best early bet. Early spring, again, uh, when the puncture vine is young and actively growing. And something else, too, you know, she mentioned about, you know, it gets worse every year. It's been getting worse every year for the last eight years. Well, the seeds can remain dormant in the soil for like four or five, six years. Yeah. Right? That's why you don't want to keep it going because you're going to be fighting ah, it for a while. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Ms. Ann. Yeah, you've got sorry. some work to do. You got some work to do. Yep. Thank you for that question. Here's our next viewer email. My yard is made up of Bermuda grass, possibly common. On the south side, I have thin grass struggling due to shade from trees behind my fence. The area gets two hours in the morning and two hours of evening sunlight. I tried fine fescue. It did well until April, but then died probably from the heat. Are there any shade tolerant Bermuda or zoysia varieties that would work here? Or should I use a fescue? And this is Pradeep, Carrieville, Tennessee. All right, Pradeep, we're here in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, at our Shelby County Extension office, which is located at the Agri Center, we have a turf plot. And in that turf plot, we have four different varieties of zoysia. Three of those will work very well in shade. Yes. G-O zoysia, mm -hmm. G-E-O, G-O zoysia, palisade zoysia, which is a very popular. My, yeah, one uh, of my favorites. Zoysia, okay, palisade is real good. And then royal zoysia. Mm -hmm. They all have excellent shade tolerance. Yes. Again, excellent shade tolerance. Yeah. They need at least four hours of filtered sun. Okay, yeah. so it looks like we might have, you know, that four might. hour here. Might, uh, Those four hours here. So four hours of filtered sun, but those grasses, would work well in your area. Yeah, I have a palisade on the north side of my okay. garage and it, it, where Bermuda and other grasses wouldn't grow, okay. it has filled in. Okay, so, so yes, you know it works. I know it works. Yeah, yeah. so it's just a beautiful grass. You know, it, it grows is. like carpet, pretty thick. You don't have to worry about weeds and things like that. But yeah. again, for shade tolerance. Yes. Yes, those uh, zoysia varieties would do you just well. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, come over over to the Shelby County Extension Office. We'd be happy to give you a tour of our grasses. And don't forget, other places in the country may have turf wheels or turf plots That's right. uh, as well. They do. So you can yeah. also visit those at your local extension offices. All right. So thank you for that question, Pradeep. Here's our next viewer email. I have a hydrangea. It is three years old. It bloomed the first year, two or three blooms. The second year, a few blooms. But last year, guess what? No blooms. Why wouldn't my hydrangea bloom? I fertilized it. It is growing well. This is Ivis from Halls, Tennessee. Ah. All right, so an hydrangea. We don't know what kind. We, yeah, we don't know what kind. We don't know what kind. Um, 
because different types of hydrangeas like to be pruned at different times of the year. So she may have inadvertently pruned it at a, the wrong time of year, which would cause it not to have blooms. Right. Um, or it could be this last cold snap we had. Yes. This was when we had unusually cold weather that a lot of hydrangeas reacted to and are not blooming. I have two that aren't blooming. Wow. And right. it's because of that. And right. there might be one or two blooms on them, but I think the cold, you know, got it down right. and, and it's not coming back to bloom this year. Right. But the, the foliage is gorgeous and beautiful and I'm hoping next year we won't get such a cold snap so it will bloom well, because I didn't prune it. it meant Mother Nature pruned Mother it Mother Nature did that for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, again, two cold snaps, really. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and the only other thing I would mention is it is, it, if it's never really bloomed well, could it be in too much shade? Uh, because uh, I used to have that problem also, and I have moved hydrangeas into a little more sun because of that. I'm like, well, the, it's shady for you, well, you know, it's bright, sure. but it's not, it wasn't enough sun for them. So that's okay. another thing that she could look at too. Right, okay, because again, you know, we don't know the conditions, mm -hmm. nor do we know, you know, which hydrangea we're talking about. Yeah. But yeah. Thinking about environmental factors, yeah, 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 we had some unusual weather this year, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, after that, you know, some of the hydrangea did very well uh, this year because of the moisture. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Ivis, I hope that uh, helps you out there. Appreciate the question. Jolly, that was fun. Thank it you was much. fun. Thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want to get more information on the plants Joel and planted, or learn more about raising goats, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South. Be safe.